Welcome to season two of Outstanding Women Leaders, Witty and Wise Conversations. I'm your host, Katie L. Mead, leadership and relationship coach by day, comedian and writer by night. I'm on a mission to host 100 million witty and wise conversations that disrupt the way leaders think and the way the world communicates. No more welcome to my TED Talks and dear Abby advice friends. It's time to start having powerful conversations and exchange of ideas without being attached to an outcome. These are the components of a witty and wise conversation that have the power to transform the way we live and lead in a profound way. Today's conversation has four rules inspired by the Coactive Training Institute. Rule number one, nobody gets to be wrong. Rule number two, nobody gets to be right. Rule number three, everybody gets to be vulnerable. And rule number four, my favorite, everything is included. We do not edit here. If any noises happen, they're staying in the podcast because this conversation is exactly what it needs to be in this moment in time. We've asked our guests to join us via video to allow us to create authentic connection. Eyes are the window to the soul. You will be seen here. You will be heard. There is space for you. Conversation is meant to be a dance, an ebb and flow, back and forth exchange of energies, thoughts, and emotions. The wit we bring to this conversation releases an endorphin known as the painkiller. You actually feel better when you laugh. The wisdom we bring to the conversation will be seen in the nugget of knowledge that you take with you to impact your own life and others on your path to greatness. When this conversation comes to a close, I will ask you, our listeners, and our guests three questions. If you've tuned in before, you know what they are. If you haven't, you don't want to miss them. Uh, but before we start talking about our guest, if you want to follow me on Instagram at Owl Professional Coaching or Outstanding Women Leaders, if you like what you hear, write us a review on Apple Podcasts or Podbean or over at our YouTube channel at Outstanding Women Leaders. Or check out my site if you want to have your own witty and wise conversation at OwlProfessionalCoaching.com. Now enough about me. Today's guest is Mia Larson. Mia grew up in Sweden. About 20 years ago, she moved to Spain. She has been studying, teaching, and coaching yoga and meditation, primarily in Europe, Central America, and in the U.S., sharing most of her time between Spain and Sweden and doing a lot of her work online. As a yoga teacher and holistic life coach, her source of inspiration is the Ayurvedic and yogic lifestyle. Her focus is to guide and help people be in the present moment, to navigate life with more ease and balance, and offer a space of support for constructive embodiment changes. The holistic approach in her coaching is reaching out to your whole being. Mindset, body, senses, energy, breath, heart, and linking together the yogic wisdom with modern neuroscience. Mia's had her own journey through anxiety and panic attacks and has witnessed how powerful the work with body and breath is to rewire thought patterns and destructive habits, creating new neural pathways that open up infinite possibility. Mia, welcome to the Outstanding Women Leaders podcast today. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you for having me. I love hearing your story uh, and journey with meditation and yoga and how it's really helped you with your quiet, your own mind and expand. Um, So share for our audience a little bit about your own personal journey through this. Yeah, sure. Um, Well, I started uh, my yoga and meditation practice uh, more or less the same time when I moved to Spain. So I was around 20 years old and um, yoga was kind of new in Barcelona where I lived in at that time. So it was popping up a lot of studios everywhere. And that's how I started. And uh, I have like a beautiful memory from one of my first classes where I started to, to practice. It was a couple Mm, and they had been living in India and then they had this like own yoga studio at home and I just remember walking out from their classes and feeling like a lightness inside that I kind of never ever felt before both like physically so like no pain no issues with my hip or my foot or my back or anything so but mostly in my case it has always been um more a question of the energy and uh, the heart (laughs) more the that is what yoga and meditation has been helping me more of course it's also the physical the physical part to it but um, for me that's 
that's how I started. And then I would just like navigating around in different, uh, tried out a lot of different styles. And I traveled a lot to Central America in that time. So that's where I did my first teacher training as well. Actually, I never thought I was going to be a teacher. It was like yoga was something that I was just like filling up my free time with. And um, I just felt it was good for me. So it was just like one of the times when I went to Costa Rica, when someone asked me like, why, why aren't you teaching? And I never thought about it before, but that's, that's how it started. Mm, I love the story of how people get drawn to teaching. You're, if you're, whatever you're filling up your spare time with, if you can take that and fill up your work time with it as well, like what a beautiful balance of work and life. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have an interesting story during our pandemic, uh, which is, if it wasn't for a pandemic, I don't know that I would have ever found meditation or uh, I had started my coaching program. So perhaps I would have, but it definitely accelerated it. Um, so you tell me a little bit about your experience. I know it was unique being on lockdown and you were in, where were you at for lockdown again? I was in Spain, in Mallorca. Yeah. So we had a lockdown for about nine weeks. And as everywhere, it came kind of sudden. So I was actually teaching in Austria and I had to come back and I come back just on the day when, uh, when the lockdown started. So I was lucky to be back. <laughs> and actually just before that, just or maybe a couple of months before I went to India and it was a really interesting journey and I didn't go for studying or anything, but it was I, I went to some ashrams and I met teachers and I was just like teaching and practicing for myself, mostly meditation. And by that time I thought, oh, maybe I should just like get a normal job again and, you know, um, just do this in my free time, maybe share it with friends, but yeah, go back to normal, more normal life and, and job. And, but then I came back to Spain I lost my normal job and I find myself like, okay, so what can I offer? Because I always, um, I always wanted to like, what, what can I give from myself? Right. Where is my generosity? Where can I direct my energy? And that's, um, that's how I started. I was just like sitting at home and looking out the window and, um, so I st decided to start, it up, to start up a meditation circle. And um, mo both for people that never had tried out meditation before. So that was one part of it. So I was giving like different techniques since I've been most into the tantric tradition, but I also know like Vedic tradition. I've done some Vipassana. So I kind of mix my meditation uh practice and teaching so so one part of this was like the teaching part of it for people who never tried before and the other part also many people signed up for the circle who did have a really thorough meditation practice but they just wanted the connection and the community of meditating together mm, I, what an amazing gift to give the world uh, thank you for starting a meditation circle at a time that was really hard. I love that the pandemic said, sorry, but we need your gifts in this world. You can't go back to a nine to five job. Uh, your gifts won't be fully tapped into. And I, I think that I see that as I owned a CrossFit gym for people teaching yoga, meditation, that grind of trying to make a business or a livelihood out of it can sometimes take away the joy that came originally from the meditation. And I know that that happened for me a little bit, trying to figure out what that balance looks like. How are you balancing now? Um, like, was it, have you felt like, oh, I still want to go back to the nine to five? Or are you really kind of fully embracing um, what God's or the universe's plan was for you? <laughs> Yeah, well, I have to acknowledge that sometimes I do think, oof, maybe I should go back to that safety uh, of a nine to five job. But anyway, it's not possible at the moment. The, the situation in Spain is really difficult anyhow. So, 
and I have been lucky. I was away for summer and I did have a good job during like, okay, really short period of time. And so I was teaching in Sweden this summer. And so I just, I kind of, I'm, I'm in that state of like flowing with what, what is coming up right now, what is coming up. And, and I have decided, for example, that the meditation circle, I will, I will continue, I will start it up again and I will continue offering it, it, it and people can just make a donation if they feel they have the capacity to, to do so. Because I found that also that in this special time that we are living right now, um, we can open up to different ways of exchange, I think. We, maybe we don't have to be, of course, it's like reality is what it is and we need to make a living. But for me, it has always been a balance between giving community classes, for example, to people that do not really have the means and then like taking more from other parts in life. So it, it kind of works out that way for me. That's where I try to find the balance. Mm. I love that you said you're in a state of flowing right now and sort of seeing what happens. I, um, what I've noticed during the pandemic for people is that it's really hard to be okay saying I'm in a flow of whatever is coming, flowing in is flowing out. Like that's what I'm hearing you say. Uh, I had my own personal pandemic when I got divorced and uh, sold my business. And so I've already been through this. Okay, guess what? We can't control anything. And the meditation, as you start to unlock your mind, you start to realize, well, there is one thing I can control, and that's how I feel, how I view certain situations. Like, um, and, and so for me, like the pandemic um, has has been great. Like, I that sounds horrible to say, but my own personal life has really the vibe, you know, taken off because of that. For you, I know you said you've struggled with some anxiety. Um, at, how has the pandemic been for you mentally? Because it is tough. It is tough. Thank you for sharing. And I think it has been tough for many people. But at the same time, I've heard many stories similar to yours, where people like suddenly had to stop a little bit and pause and look around and and see do i do i like the way i live uh, do i like my job what how do i spend my time family friends etc so i think that has been like an important and it's still it's going on it will go on for for months i guess uh, like this process of uh, reinventing ourselves and <laughs> pausing and and look what what we really want in life right so that was this is what this pandemic is also doing to me to myself and i think that also it sounds a bit um i don't know the word in english but you know sometimes you think that okay now i worked enough with myself actually i do not really suffer anxiety anymore in the way i used to I had many years ago since I had my last panic attack, but that doesn't mean that it could happen again, right? So in a way, after many years of therapy, yoga, meditation, it's like, I don't know, maybe I, I'm worked with, you know? But this, <laughs> because maybe I hoped I was, right? But this pandemic really um, made me look at patterns that I hadn't looked at before. So there are new, yeah, there are some patterns that didn't come out to light before and they do now. So this is what I'm working with now. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I, I'm going to share and then I'm going to ask you what some patterns you've noticed because I, I, same for me. I love that you said maybe I'm worked with. <laughs> <laughs> I reached the end of my coaching training and, and part of the coaching training and co-active is they want you to go through a client journey yourself so that you can coach that. And so I get to the end of this last class where I get to get all my superpowers back and I get to use all of the powers I have, who I am to just use my intuition coach. And I'm like, you know, I think I'm done. Like I think maybe I'm worked with, um, or as we say in coactive, um, everyone is naturally creative, resourceful and whole. 
um, all of us are worked with when we're born. Um, but what happens is, as you mentioned, like things come up and that you didn't notice before, those blind spots. And for me, my personal um, blind spots that I really come up in the work that I've done is on judgment. I don't like judgment. I, and we have a phrase in Coactive, what you can't be with runs your life. So if I can't be with judgment, um, that means I'm judging judgment and that's a whole circle and now I'm judging. Uh, and so I've become more aware um, of how my, of my wanting to avoid my creates problems. It creates things to judge if I avoid having the conversation. And so in one of the classes, we spent three days with what we can't be with and mine was, inconvenient truth and the inconvenient truth is that we all judge that is our amygdala's job is to judge is this going to be good or is this going to be bad and during the pandemic what i've really come to terms with is that it is not good or bad it just is which is a huge part of meditation i know um so for you like what are some of those things that you realized that you have you don't need to work on you. You're wonderful. You are complete, creative, resourceful, and whole. Uh, but what blind spots came up for you? Yeah, I love that you say that, actually, that in the coactive training, that you have that as a phrase, that you, you are already whole as you, as you, when you were born, right? Because that's also the same thing as we say in yoga. So it's like in very ancient philosophy that we come out and we are already perfect. So I think the journey that we are in is also to recognize that perfect beings that we are, not only in ourselves, but also in the people around us. So that's like one thing when you, what are you doing with this program, right? Like connecting with other perfect beings, perfect, you know what I mean? Not, not perfect in a sense, because I work so much, I'm totally perfect, but just because that's, that's who we are. We are whole. And uh, so, but we are whole with those many blind spots. We can, we can refine so many things, right? So I found, uh, I think last year or maybe two years ago, I, I read The Presence Process of Michael Brooks. I think it is. I don't know if you know about it. And um, so he talks a lot about recognizing patterns of reaction and responses. So, and I've, found out during this uh, last six months, uh, maybe a lot more reactions that, that I have that I didn't really recognize that I had before. So I've been working with that just so what he suggests it's uh, to, yeah, he has, it's like a 10 week program actually that he presents in the book. But uh, as soon as you recognize a reaction, you, you, before you react and express it, it's just like to stop and to pause and to feel what is happening. And then you can go back if you have time at that moment, or if not, you do it in meditation later. You sit in meditation and you remember, oh, how was that that I reacted so badly to my partner this morning when he spilled out the coffee? And then you have to go back. When was the last time I felt like that? And then, and what, when was the time before I felt in the same way? And then you go back and you go back, you go back until you find like the source of that feeling, because you know, all the reactions that we have in our daily lives, it, they, they don't really have to do with what is going on in that moment, but with all the patterning that we have. So yeah, this, this pandemic, I kind of found uh, patterns that, that I didn't really want it to see before. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I realized there's so much more to work with, basically. Yeah, the, you know, the patterns in our brain, our default system, uh, our brain takes a lot of energy to activate our prefrontal cortex and to think 20% of our body's energy goes towards supporting our brain. And our, so our brain wants to be efficient. I, like, I, did, I, I had a CrossFit gym, so CrossFitters were all about efficiency. And so we automatically default to these patterns because that is, takes much less energy from our brains. And 
So what I really noticed um, during this time when I moved in with my partner this past month is my energy is depleted. Like my brain doesn't have as much capacity. And so I was defaulting to patterns, um, as you mentioned, that felt comfortable and safe in my brain. Um, so building new neural pathways through meditation has been a huge, like, whoo, eye opener for me. Uh, I love that you talked about him having you meditate through the patterns. Um, it's similar to what the positive intelligence work with Shazad that we were talking about before is doing. Um, only instead of going deeper and deeper, he gives you a test so you can label it. He gives you a universal language so that you can just say, this is what it is. And then every time you see that pattern, and I think this is very helpful for clients in particular, is you can say, oh, the judge is here. Oh, the avoider is here. Oh, the stickler. You know, um, it's better than, than tying it to you. And what I find for um, clients when they do this work is then all of a sudden you start judging yourself for being judgmental and you start <laughs> judging, like you just kind of get a little hyperactive in it. And, and it's, it's just a label to, to laugh. You know, my secret, one of my secret ingredients in reinvention is laughing. So in the pandemic, if you can laugh at the things that are popping up for you, you know, I, I'm currently really struggling to laugh that my unemployment check hasn't shown up since April, but I'm still laughing because I know that I'm more resourceful than the government. And when it does show up, it'll be the right moment in time. Um, so that's my secret ingredient to add to the meditation is the laughter. Uh, is there any, are there any particular patterns that you did not find funny to start that you are able to kind of laugh and embrace that in the, the third person type of way? Because it's not Mia, right? Mia doesn't show up with these patterns. It's whatever name you want to give that because who you are is not that pattern. Exactly. I love that. I love that you add the laughing part into meditation. That's beautiful. You always like, you never seen a Buddha meditating without a smile, right? So there's always this smile. It's always this inner smile, or if it could be a big laughter, that's, that's amazing. That's fantastic too. So I love that. <laughs> I would make a note. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because I was just meditating yesterday and like I've been feeling my face smile a lot more it, like, and I've been doing a lot of guided meditation. So the idea of the, the guided meditation, it, it kind of tiptoes on hypnotherapy a little bit as it really takes you into a place. And I felt euphoric. I felt joy. Um, and that's the beauty for people living in a pandemic to be able to realize you can take your mind to a place where you won't even realize it until your face is smiling and your heart feels open. And here you are sitting in, you know, chaos because the world is on fire in America as we prepare for this election. Um, right? So you, sometimes you do have to laugh at those patterns to feel like you can overcome them. It's, it's not funny when I'm ugly and, and say bad things, but it's funny when the judge comes out or you know the avoider comes out it's funny to laugh at those things when my dan is a stickler so uh we'll laugh at his stickler coming out he doesn't think there's anything wrong with that though which is why it's funny <laughs> because he's such a stickler it's like yeah that's the way you do it like yeah that's you do you know the destructive behaviors that a stickler can have on relationships it's still funny because you're so stuck in how you're right. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, actually, when you, I'm, I'm remembering now when you're talking uh, that that was some months ago and that I realized, okay, for, because one way for me that I love to think about meditation is that Okay, we want to come. We want to come to the state when we remember who we are, like that we are divine, perfect beings, whatever how we want to call it, like light, love, wisdom. So, and there are so many different ways that we can get there, and for some people it works with a more ascetic practice, like a vipassana practice, where you start only observing how the breath is moving through your nostrils, and that is the only thing you do. And as soon as you feel anything, you just observe. You never go into it. You're just observing. 
So that is one of the Buddhist traditions. There are so many different ones. And then in the tantric tradition, there are so many different visualization practices that you can do. And that, for me, they have helped me a lot to, because I'm a very um, imaginary person. Can you say that? I have very easy to see the pictures inside. And so, so that has helped me to go beyond, beyond my rational mind. Because for me, meditation is not to have like a blank paper because it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean, it just like, it wants us to take, it for me, it wants us to take to a place where we don't engage in our emotions and thoughts and we understand that they are different from ourselves. Like when you can laugh about them, right? When you can laugh at it, you also understand because you're not like laughing at yourself. You are laughing at a part of yourself or at a pattern. So, yeah, for me, there are times when I need a certain meditation and then there are times when I need a different, different mm. um, kind of meditation. So that is why I also make people try different ways to reach because so, so then they can feel, okay, this practice goes along with me or my, my current life situation. Yeah. I love that you talk about the different types of meditation because that's something I, I didn't know existed. Like my little brain was like, okay, meditation, you go to yoga, like you're supposed to be quiet, all these thoughts. I can't keep my brain quiet for five seconds. Um, the first meditation that I did were 10 second reps and more of a mindfulness practice that built up a muscle in my brain. It built a new neural pathway that said, we like this. <laughs> this is this is helpful. Let's try it a little bit longer. And you know, I remember the first twelve minute one I did, um, and the build up I got to that twelve minutes were in these two minute increments and some visualization where when I would see when thoughts would happen, I would pick them up and place them on a lily pad and watch them float away and. For me, the, the, the meditation I needed to start was to think of nothing. Like it really was to just be. Um, and I think a lot of times when I, when I was starting to meditate before, it was, okay, I'm going to meditate on this idea and see if it's good. Uh, <laughs> versus, no, we're going to get rid of every thought that you have and we're going to just be. And what, ha what, I've, what I've been developing in my own practice is when those thoughts come, I have two different lily pads now. I have the lily pad of ideas that I want to come back to and explore, but not right now because we're meditating. And then I have the lily pad of like, that's a judgment. That's a avoidant. That like I, I, most everything I can tie back to some type of, of judgment. Is it a past circumstance I'm judging? Like whatever those thoughts are. And the, so the power I've seen from letting them flow and then placing them into two buckets uh, allows me to come and sit down for my work and know that everything I'm doing is my authentic self because I just spent time meditating and taking all the ideas I didn't want to have because they were judgment and letting them float away and then taking all the ideas I did want to have and letting them float towards hey come back to me again <laughs> like like a circle um so meditation is really powerful if you talk about like, the story the visualization the metaphors I love that stuff I can picture it in my head. And uh, I've been talking to a lot of people about the mental health. So I'd love to come back to you a little bit and talk about the anxiety that you had had before and, uh, and how you see clients even shift their own mindsets after meditating. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it, it, does, it does really work. Uh, I, I heard a, a different chapter as you talked with a meditation teacher. I think she was based in Germany from Burma. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting also. So how, and she had an example with a client of hers. And um, yeah, so I think what works for most people if you haven't meditated before is as you said okay it can be 10 seconds it it has to be it doesn't have to be okay i try to sit down for one hour or i have to do it in this way or in that way and i also i have to sit up or i have to you know i have to have the correct posture or whatever like people have so many ideas about what meditation is and 
actually, I think what most of us in the West, we are practicing towards meditation. Mm -hmm. We are not really meditating. Uh, or we are meditating like milliseconds or like 10 seconds here or two seconds there. That's when we really come to that state of total awareness and calmness and happiness and joy. And, and so we are, what we are doing, we are practicing towards meditation. And um, I found for myself that what was the, one of the basic keys for me uh, in in my anxiety was to be aware of my breath so it didn't mean that i was sitting down meditating and then it went away it was just like in when i felt when i started to recognize this is anxiety this can be built up to a panic attack when i started to recognize those patterns mm -hmm. i could pause and instead of going into old patterns of maybe calling someone or just like uh, fall down on the floor in my house or whatever, I just stayed in the situation and, and I was breathing. So, and th that for me, it's like a practice towards meditation in, in the end. So it's like be, being practicing, but in the moment when it's actually, when it actually happening. So that's one part of it. And that's, I've been working with, with several clients when we, we've been working with, uh, maybe we had also um, a physical yoga practice and then we have a meditation part of it. And uh, after a time, it always has to be, the, like they have different, it, like after three weeks, normally you can see a change in a person. Uh, so... I had, for example, a client uh, maybe half a year ago, and we met twice a week. And she had a really she had a physical uh, issue that she was working with, but it was not like the physical issue who was harming her, uh, but it was the anxiety that it that that brought her. So I could really feel a change after just like one month. And then even more after three months. And that is also what she has been witnessing to me about. So that, but that was both, both doing the meditation in the classes, like twice a week and giving her the tools so that she could, every time she felt anxiety was going to come to fall into not her normal pattern or what she would be, what she would, would have been doing, but breathing. So for me, the breath is the very first tool that we can use because you don't need anything. You don't need an app. You don't need earphones. You don't need anything. You just need your own breath. Yeah. Breath is my favorite go-to of, of getting mindful and meditating as well. And, and when you think, we think about anxiety, it's thoughts, right? So if you're focusing on your breath, the only thought you're having is what is the temperature of the air as it comes out of my nostrils? What is the sound that I hear as I breathe in and out, right? You're just bringing, you're bringing your mind back to what is real and what is here in the now. And that immediately will activate your prefrontal cortex and it will just quiet your amygdala, which is where all of those anxious thoughts are coming from, because that's the amygdala's job to keep us vigilant. Uh, and, and it wasn't until I understood the neuroscience and what was happening in the brain that I said, okay, <laughs> I believe you, let's try it. And it's, it's very powerful. It is not the, um, the hippy dippy stuff that people like, the woo woo stuff that we've talked about, the science behind it. And it completely makes sense if you, if you think about what an anxiety attack is. Um, I like to have clients write down everything that when they're stuck of what's real and what's not real. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're connecting with your breath and you're having, let's say you're having an anxiety attack about money, Right? So you're connecting with your breath. Like, What's real in this moment? I have money in my bank account. What else is real in this moment? You know, you can, and you can walk yourself through all the things that are real about money. And it turns out, okay, there's a lot of really positive things there. All right, what's not real about money? Well, I don't it's not real that I don't have any. <laughs> so it's not real that I need to be concerned about it because I have it. Um, 
And then you'll see, you know, people can say, well, what if I didn't have money? And like, well, then what's real? Well, but allowing yourself to be present in that moment and really connect with what is happening and what's, what's tangible and real now really allows your brain to do what it was designed to do in the prefrontal cortex, which is empathize. So you can feel better about yourself, be creative, um, come up with solutions. Like that's what your prefrontal cortex is designed to do. I think a lot of times we don't realize but we're letting our amygdala make decisions. We're letting them be the creative ones. We're letting them hold the pen and write the story. And that story is a survival story. You know, our amygdala allowed us to survive for millions of years. It's also allowed us to survive childhood because that's the part of the brain that was working when we were children as our prefrontal cortex developed. And so one of my favorite um, meditations, visualizations that I've done uh, was where I took a walk in my brain and uh, really did. Like I walked around in there and I decided I wanted to sit close to the front and I peeled apart my left and right brain because there's a road right there that starts with some a C that I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. And I was like, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to visually be when I make decisions. Um, so what's changed and shifted for me and in, in, in the breathing that you talked about is I find myself starting to default to that now. Mm. And when I, I'm like, Ooh, I'm noticing my breath. I think it might, do I need a recharge? Like that's what I'm starting to notice is that my body is sending me signals now that says meditate before we do this thing. Do you, and I, I have only been doing this for a short amount of time. You have years and years, decades of practice. Like I do feel that connection where you're just now being called to say, okay, I got this really important decision. Let's go meditate. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because, and that's, I was thinking when, as you were talking also, that's why it's so important in these times because we have like the amygdala and the, and the reptilian brain is so, so active because we are just like, it's all about survival right now. It's all about survival. So that is why as we go back to our breath, so many things are happening on an unconscious level like really rewiring the brain and letting it work as it has to work at, as it natures is, as you said. And, um, and so, and then on, on, on a level that we can feel, which we, we just calming down because mostly anxiety, as you said, it's, it's in our thoughts and thoughts is always about future. What can happen or, Oh, like victimizing ourselves for what has been mm -hmm. so we cannot change what has been but we can change the way we look at it and we cannot we don't know what is going to happen in the future and we know even less at this moment like we cannot plan we can this is what many clients say to me come and say to me now it's so hard because i can't i can't plan anything i don't know when when i will see my family next and you know we really have to live day by day so I think that if we can expand and be meditating a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit, bit more people like every day, that, that, will make, that will make a big difference. That will make like a difference in the microcosmos and in the macrocosmos. Yes, uh, absolutely. And so you know from meditation that the vibrations, the frequency that you give off it changes as you work up the, the hertz scale of vibration. So when I think about our world right now, and it's a mess in the U.S., mm -hmm. as it is in many places, um, the vibrations that we're all giving off um, as a collective are, are very low. It's, a, it's an anger. It's a fear. It's, those vibrations on the hertz scale are very low. And the very top is enlightenment. Um, there's joy below that, there, and peace, or peace, and then there's joy. Um, and so that is why I'm on a mission to have 100 million witty and wise conversations. And why I want to connect people like you to the world is because we as a collective can change the vibrations. Our leaders are a reflection of, of our energy. And, and who we are. And so in the United States, although the majority of the people that voted don't like the man in the White House, 
uh, we've spent four years vibrating in the same place of anger and fear and frustration. And during this pandemic, you see it, it's changed the way that we relate to each other as humans in the last four years. And I've noticed a shift for people in, on the social media where everyone's talking about your, your, your five people. You gotta get this inner circle of five people and vibrate at the same energy together and then manifest your dreams. Um, and I, I think that's a reflection of, of where we're at, where we think that, oh, if we just hang out with people that are positive and amazing, that our lives will be amazing. And the meditation is the higher collective. You need to vibrate with those five people so that your five people can go out and vibrate to everyone else. You know, Jesus went around hanging out with people that weren't vibrating at the same level that, were, that he was um, so that he could level them up. And, and that's, I, that's what you're doing. And I'm so grateful that the pandemic has set, shifted you back into this space to bring these gifts to the world and that you're, you're flowing with it because we need more people like you spreading this message and connecting with people that have never meditated before so that we can shift our thoughts. And, you know, I, what if the entire thought collective in the uh, United States was that our President Trump was going to be amazing? Doesn't mean he was going to be amazing. But if our whole collective had been given that energy of He's going to do the best he can, and we're going to find a better candidate next time. <laughs> Versus the energy that was, he sucks, four years, we're going back to the blue. Like, we just, we didn't, you know, that energy hasn't shifted. And I just want to bring that collective up here that says, you know, when the anxiety and the fear goes away, what's left is creation. Like, what do you want to create? What do you want to do? Um, so for people that are in a pandemic right now, call Mia get a hold of her. She has a meditation circle on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern time that you can join. Check it out. She's very generously offering it as a donation only class, which is incredible. And it's online. So you have an opportunity to meditate with Mia and really start to create new neural pathways. Um, she also has an online yoga on Thursdays at 1230. So you can go from meditation circle to yoga with Mia which is my next step. I'm, I need to start connecting my breath with my movement of my body. And that is, so that is what's next for me uh, as I head into my journey. Mia, yeah, I have, I, I'm jumping the gun because I always ask three questions and one of them is what's next for you. <laughs> I went out and shared what's next for me. Um, so we're going to work our way backwards through these. Um, what's next for you as you are entertaining this flow state and tackling old patterns? Well, next for me is like stepping in and uh, on, on personal level, stepping into um, investigating a little bit more about my inner voices and these different roles that I have that I have been discovering lately. So that's uh, on a private level, and uh, and then I'm going on with this uh, with the meditation circle. And yeah, it's it's funny that you say that your next step is yoga because I wanted to say that we've been talking a lot about meditation today, which I love, but I do believe that for for our meditation to work, we also need to work with our bodies. So this is this is the manifestation of the energy so this is who we are this is like human flesh body skeleton this is we need we need to work with that because our mind is in our bodies so it's so important to to work with our body it's always also work with, with our brains so one thing that yoga does between all the things it does to us is that it's balancing the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. So as we said that we have our reptilian brains very active right now, we also have the parasympathetic uh, nervous system um, not so active. So we need to balance that up and be more in, in that state. So that's why we need our conscious movement as well. Yes, I like perked up when you threw out science language that I don't have memorized yet because I recognize it. And what I believe I've learned about that is those two systems cannot operate at the same time. 
um, so which is interesting to know. And so you need to be able to switch back and forth between your systems and you want to do so quickly. Um, breath and body connection will help build those neural pathways. So I'm glad you brought that up for us because you're absolutely right. And where I struggled with yoga um, was because I needed to connect with my breath first. I don't know if you find like this has to come, but like chicken and egg, I don't know that there really is like any right or wrong answer. I know for me, I couldn't connect in yoga because I wasn't connected to my own breath first. So when I went to yoga, all I could think about was I can't do these poses. I can't breathe when she says like, she's telling me to breathe in. Like I'm still breathing out from the time before. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was my, like I, nothing about that is being in yoga, meditation, or mindful. Um, and so I think some people can connect in their body and then they get a breath. Like I realized, you know, for me, it was like showing up to the dance floor with two left feet. Uh, and I just did a yoga thing online for a woman. She had a fundraiser. And for the first time I flowed, not perfectly, but I flowed and felt the difference of flowing where my breath was actually connected to my body. So I'm ready for more. I might, I might be in that next class. Um, you know, yoga's, yoga, yoga's different, as you know. And so what I was always looking for was that class that was going to allow me to connect with my body and breath. I felt like they moved too fast. People are trying to get their workout done in their yoga class. So they're trying to keep the heart rate up. <laughs> like, um, so what, tell me a little bit about the yoga practice that you have so that for people listening that actually know things about yoga, they know what, they're, what kind of courses that you're offering. Yeah, um, I practice something called uh, bowspring. So I I do say that I practice yoga with bowspring with the bowspring method. So bowspring, it's um, it was invented maybe eight years ago. It's a kind of a new practice, and it brings together the yogic wisdom with the uh, modern anatomy. And uh, so the founders are John Friend and Desi Springer in Denver, Colorado. So it's a little bit different from the classic, uh, from the classic Hatha or Ashtanga yoga. Uh, for example, we move together with the breath. So we do a lot of pulsation. So as the universe is pulsing, so is the body pulsing. So we don't look for static poses. It's like nothing in nature is static. So we do pulse. Uh, in the poses and the poses are more curvy it's like a curvy alignment um, as opposed to like the more linear uh, alignment from the classic yoga so all this is like a yoga more adjusted to a uh, modern western world so where we do really need to balance out uh, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system and uh, we need to find a dynamic posture that we can work with. We sit a lot by the computer, we sit a lot in the car, so we might need a little bit of a different uh, relationship to our body than they could do like in, in India um, 200 years ago, where, the, where most of the physical poses in yoga started. So this is why, this is what has most been resonating with me. I've been practicing many different styles, but this is now what I feel more, more uh, safe and honest uh, in sharing. It's, so it's a curvy alignment. It works with um, toning the myofascia. So you're activating the body uh, like on, a, all, on all levels at the same time. So it's a very vibrational practice, very, very energetic practice. And I do believe it, kind, it can be easier to connect with your breath because we, we do really basic things to start. So I, now I know what's next for me. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm in. Um, as we close today, I, always, I have my three questions. Everybody already knows now what's next for both of us, which is me taking your class. Um, Mia, what's your superpower? Whoa. Um, I think my superpower is that I'm a good listener. Mm. You are. I've talked a lot today. <laughs> you are an amazing listener. Um, what's your purpose? What is my purpose? Um, to, to listen. Mm. 
I and think. learn. I hear you listening and learning. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And what's next for her as she is listening and learning is meditation circle on Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern time and yoga class on Thursdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time, which I will definitely be checking out um, Thursdays. I'm like, now I'm thinking, wait, can I on Thursdays? I think I actually do have room on my schedule at 12.30 on Thursdays. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. I talked to 10. You're an incredible listener. You're, um, I'm excited to see what else is next for both of us as I take your class. I'm gonna give you the last word though, because I've talked enough here. So what, um, Anything else you want to share with us about breath, body, mind connection? Mm. Oh, I love that word connection. I think that's, that's what it's about to connect. I'm really grateful to have been part of your, of your project. I think it's a beautiful project. I'm very happy to have been sharing with you and listening to you and uh, learning. <laughs> so yeah, I think that, um, that is what meditation and, and uh, the conscious movement practices for me. It's about connection, connection to yourself and connection to other beings. Yeah. I love that. That's what coaching is for me too. Thank you so much for joining us. You can learn more about Mia. Uh, Mia, what's your website? That is uh, uh, www.miaeyoga. So that's M-I-A-E yoga.com. M-I-A-E yoga.com. And when her episode airs, you can go to my link in my bio and find her website and learn more about um, meditation circles, which I'm going to post a video um, on social media before that. So people know they can show up. Is it this Thursday? Yes. Excellent. I can definitely make this Thursday for that yoga class as well. Is yoga happening this Thursday? Yes. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mia. Thank you, Katie, for having me.